as here now in the era of social colonization where we can colonize every web page with our Facebook like and similar. Next is the era of social context. We talk about this a bit in terms of customization of our user experience. If we supposedly we know about our users, as Feda was saying, then we can give uh, a personalized experience to web users about the web. Next, what this vision uh, envisions is the era of social commerce where web users will be the one defining what kind of uh, characteristics and features products and services will will have and companies will have to bid to uh, create these products and services. So, well, yeah, there was a lot of discussion about big data and why it's challenging. So it's not just about the size, but also about the speed of, uh, of the, our data processing uh, techniques and also the sources that we've discussed in this symposium. And I want to stress once again the, the fact that today we don't really have still uh, a way to really collect this information. This uh, information is just out there, but it's very hard for us to put it together in a meaningful way. So many people like to talk about collective intelligence, but what we really have so far is just a collected intelligence. We have things there and we don't really can, we can't really uh, integrate things, aggregate information in a meaningful way. So I like to show this graph which is really along the line of what we've discussed during this symposium. So we, we, we've seen that bag of words is still very popular because many machine learning techniques still use it, but we really need to jump to the next level where we're using concept, where concept can be a multi-word expression or anything that we can associate to, to words. So it's not just about a word itself, but how is this word meaningful in a specific context? So Francis was, was talking about the, the hot dog. Here later I will talk about the pipe. Hot dog is not a hot dog. A pipe is not a pipe. What does it really mean? It's not just about the, the word itself. The word itself doesn't really mean anything. If I Google pipe, I will just get the the web pages that contain that word, but does Google really know what the meaning of pipe is? Especially for uh, NLP tasks, we have to look at multi-word expressions and the order is, is important. If I'm, if I'm talking about cloud computing, I don't want to break that semantic atom into single words, otherwise I risk to categorize the document into something related to weather, when in fact it's about technology. And in opinion mining, it's, it's even worse because if we consider single words instead of multi-word expression, we may get a completely opposite polarity, and that's definitely what we don't want. So we talk about uh, domain knowledge, extra knowledge, and, and here I want to stress that there is a big difference between uh, what, what we can call common knowledge. This is like vocabulary knowledge that we can find on Freebase and Wikipedia and common sense knowledge. This kind of knowledge is not really something that we can find on the web because it's too trivial for us for, to put it on the web. We won't easily find things like uh, I need a, a pen to write or, or a glass to, to drink water. In fact, if you try to mine common sense from the web, you would find definitely wrong information. Like if I ask Google if car can fly, I will find that car can fly because it makes the news when a car can or, can or can swim or something like that. When there's something interesting, you find interesting things, but you don't find common sense. And common sense is particularly useful for opinion mining because when you have easy adjectives like great and faulty, then it's, it's easy to, to define a polarity. But there are other tricky adjectives like we were talking before with Chris, something like low or long. It doesn't really have a polarity on its own. It gets a polarity once you combine it with another uh, noun in this case or even verb plus noun. And how do I know that long battery long battery is good or not, like I can learn it from a corpus or maybe I can use my common sense knowledge about battery life to infer 
that long battery life is positive. So how do we do that? We have a semantic network. You can think of this as, a, as an ontology, but it's actually different. So we have, in the nodes, we have multi-word expressions. So not just single words, but also, also multi-word expression. It can be two words, three, or even more. And there are different ways you can reason on this network. One way we do it is to represent it as a, as a matrix. What's powerful about this is that then you can uh, inf even infer new knowledge. Because, if, for example, if you wonder if the newspaper contains knowledge or not, you can find semantically related concepts like book and magazine. And because these also contain knowledge, then you can infer that to a certain extent, newspaper also contains knowledge. And how do I say that? book and magazine are similar to newspaper, you can look at the features, at the semantic features that these share. So a quicker and easier way to do this kind of analogical reasoning is to uh, reduce the dimensionality of this matrix and obtain a, a, a vector space representation where you have multi-word expressions like big shower and pay cash and whatever, receipt degree, and because of how I built this vector space, because I compressed all the semantic features that these concepts were sharing, then I'm likely to have concepts that are semantically, semantically and in this case also affectively related, closer to, the, closer to themselves. So if I calculate the dot product between these two multi-word expressions, I expect it to be smaller if they are semantically related and, and bigger, like closer, either closer to zero or one according to their semantic relatedness. Then because we are doing opinion mining, we are interested in categorizing, in clustering the space if you want, using a, an emotion categorization model. So we have talked about emotions a lot in this symposium, and this is yet another emotion categorization model. There are a lot because I believe that, according to the task, you may need to use a different one. In this case, because we actually calculate polarity in terms of emotions, we use this representation where you have four affective dimensions. According to uh, this a dimension can be active at the same time. So you can actually reason on emotions both on a um, categorical level and also dimensional level. For example, if I have a a positive activation of pleasantness and aptitude at the same time that's usually recognized as the compound emotion of love. So you can reason on emotions also at a, an emotional level. But the focus of this talk is about scentic patterns. So I skip all the part that, that tells you about how, how, how these, these tools are actually built, but you can actually download all these tools on scentic.net the easiest way to do this is probably to use our API, which is basically an RDF XML dump that gives you for each multi-word expression like celebrate special occasion, a set of semantically related concepts, some values that are related to those affected dimension I've just discussed, and then the thing that most people are interested in is actually the polarity. So I get a polarity value that goes with from minus one to one and tells me how positive or negative each, each concept is. So the focus of this talk is about uh, what we call scenting patterns. This is based on previous studies of how conjunctions and negation actually affect polarity. And I want to stress here that uh, when we use bag of words or machine learning techniques, we may lose uh, very um, crucial information about the message that is being delivered, especially if I'm talking about a very short message like a tweet. So these two sentences, for example, are exactly the same from a bag of word point of view, but they actually have different polarity. If I say that something is nice but expensive, then the polarity is negative because it means that I'm not really going to buy it, although I say that it's nice. In the other case, I say that yes, it's expensive but nice. So what it counts in this case is whatever comes after the but conjunction. So this is actually positive and this is negative. So this is the simplest, uh, simplest pattern we have 
And this is also powerful because we can even infer new polarities from terms that we don't know. If I don't know that nice is positive and I have negative but undefined, I can infer that the final polarity is positive and I can also infer that this one is positive. There's more than this, so there are a lot of other part patterns. So this shows you how you cannot just take words and you have to consider more than just words, but also not just that even the engrams are not enough because if I say I may be sarcastic, I need to know that gaining weight is something that people generally don't want. So if I say that something is perfect to gain weight, although I have positive words like perfect and gain, then actually the polarity is negative. So the way it works, so here is just to stress that I need to look at the structure. The structure, so I'm a computer scientist, but um, we are here in the linguistic department for a reason. We need to look at the structure and the, at, at, at the structure, the, the, the patterns, the linguistic patterns of text. So in a sentence like this, the old way to process this would just to look at keywords. So you would see keywords like old and expensive and then infer a negative polarity. But actually what we're trying to do here is to build like an electric, electronic circuit of the sentence because here we have different, different conjunction, different structure all together embedded in one, in one sentence. So you can see it as, a, as an electronic circuit because whenever I have a negation then I have to flip the polarity. And if I have but, I have to think of those patterns that we saw before. So in the end, it works a little bit like this, where you start from some uh, sources, and then according to the, to the um, elements that you have, you calculate a final polarity. So if I have something like negative but positive, then because of this structure, you get positive as a, as a result. Of course, this is uh, very limited by the prior knowledge I have about my concepts, my data. So the actual framework is this, and, and this is nice in a sense because it, it's not just based on one approach. Here we use, uh, we use linguistics, we use knowledge, and we use machine learning all together. The fact is that this approach it's very limited by the richness of your knowledge base. But there are things that, there will be always some concepts or words that I don't have in my knowledge base. So the way we go about it is to use, whenever we can, we use those patterns. When we don't, we use machine learning. And you can see that if you use this loop, then you can improve your accuracy over just using the sentic patterns. And we compare this with Stanford sentiment analysis, and it turns out to be better because what Stanford does and most statistical tools, tools do is to uh, leverage on the statistical polarity of, of words. So if I have if I have words like hate, because it's so uh, this so often happens occurs in negative documents. This in Stanford is negative. But what I'm really trying to calculate here is the polarity of whoever is speaking. So if I say that I love something, then the polarity is positive no matter what comes afterwards. And so we work on this according to those patterns that we talked about before. So it, it's not just about the statistical uh, uh, polarity features associated with words, but also the structure. We need to look at the structure of words. Then, because I'm the last presenter, I want to uh, raise some challenges. So that there are there are many things that we still need to tackle in uh, in sentiment analysis. One is theory of mind on or intention awareness. So we said that we need to do a user profiling to actually know um, if something is positive or negative. So I how can I say if uh, hard, bad is positive or negative, it depends on the user preferences. And same with things like uh, big and small room, like it depends on what's my intention. If my, 
if my intention is to stay in this room, then I want it big. But if I have to clean the room, then I prefer it to be small. And same like here, like it is good that you kill the professor, then is this positive or negative? Depends on who we are trying to uh, calculate the polarity of. So uh, these are all things that we have discussed in the past in, in previous uh, um, special issues. One was the one in, in intelligent system was about talking about how to uh, take into account content, concept, and context, because then, as we said, even a multi-word expression alone doesn't have a polarity if we don't associate it to a specific context. And then, because we work a lot with uh, common sense as well, we realize more and more that besides having uh, some semantics, you also need some emotional information about your concepts and also a cultural differences as we've seen with Elvis before. So, and this not only applies to sentiment analysis, but more or less for any NLP task. If you want to, if your NLP task requires more, uh, a finer grain of understanding, then you need to look at these things. Then, just to conclude, for those who weren't here this morning, I I wanted to talk about this, uh, to tell you that there is this chance for you to get uh, a paper either in www or NACL and then this other workshop on emotions if you are in the agent community and finally Sentier which is our <coughs> workshop series in ICDN since uh, 2011. Any questions? <coughs>